Hi, I'm Stacy Studebaker, a 32-year resident of Kodiak, and um, I'm one of the lucky people that get to volunteer in the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge. And since I retired from teaching high school biology, I've done a number of projects with the refuge, including this big project behind me, which you see, the Kodiak Gray Whale Project. For the rest of the day, we watched it drift into the bay and then the riptides carried it across over to the state land beyond the cabins and as the tide receded, it, it uh, deposited the dead whale on the beach. Uh, my head just started spinning at that point and I thought this is such a tragedy but this could result in a very wonderful project for the community. So um, I made some phone calls and got permission to preserve the whale for an educational project to re-articulate the skeleton which would be hung in some location at that time not determined uh, in the community and the project just kind of took off from there. Looking at this large dead gray whale um, my head was trying to explore a lot of different uh, ideas for preserving the skeleton and one of the most obvious ways is to get a bunch of knives and people and flints off all the the flesh and that really didn't appeal to me too much and so talking with some other people um, we decided collectively that the best option was to bury the whale uh, in a in a trench and get it way underground so that the bears wouldn't dig it up and other scavengers wouldn't go for it get it underground and let mother nature let the bacteria in the soil take care of the decomposition well this was a huge experiment because as far as my research went and anybody in the in the community knew no, nobody had ever tried to preserve a whale in Alaska this way in other places yes warmer climates underground yes uh, but given the soil temperature here, which is pretty cold, um, people were pretty skeptical about uh, the bacteria being able to do the job underground and people speculated how long it would take. Some people said three or four years, other thought 20 years, so there was a whole spectrum. Three years later, after the whale was buried, um, a new manager came to the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge named Leslie Kerr, and she was in the process of designing a new visitor center for downtown Kodiak, and she heard about my whale underground and heard that I was looking for a location for the skeleton eventually, and she approached me and uh, asked if I was willing to work with the Fish and Wildlife Service to make this whale skeleton part of a display for the new visitor center. Well, in 2004, this is four years after we buried the whale, I was really getting anxious and I, I was having dreams about what was happening under the ground and I'd walk out there every once in a while and, and kind of look around and the, the ground was sinking over the whale and I was thinking, well, something must be going on there, you know, maybe there's some decomposition going. I worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service to get some machinery out there to dig a test pit. So with a bobcat and some shovels and some strong hands, we dug down to where I thought about the center of the whale would be, and we hit bare bones, uh, which was a really good sign. There was a little bit of tissue, but we poked around and we found a humerus and we found some ribs that didn't have any tissue on them. And so, so I made the decision that that was the year, the following summer was the year to uh, bring the whale out of the ground. Excavation day started on August 16th, 2004, and uh, we really lucked out with weather. Uh, Mike Anderson showed up with his track hoe and uh, very carefully removed the soil on the top of the whale, and he dug a wide pit around the whale that was terraced so the sides of the soil wouldn't fall into the pit while the uh, volunteers were working. The second day, a whole another group of volunteers showed up and we decided that the best um, 
excavation tool were large industrial spoons. We didn't want to use pointed objects because we didn't want people hurting the bones, so we bought a, a couple of dozen of these very large stainless steel spoons, which proved to be just perfect. By the end of the third day, we had all the bones out of the pit. All the bones that were transported back to town on these flatbed trucks to Gibson Cove, um, where National Marine Fisheries, or NOAA, has a secure dock with a fence on it. And they offered to house the bones out there so that we could wash them out, off and let them sit out there for about nine months to drip more fat out of the bones. Well, around about this time, I realized that this was a bigger job <laughs> than I had anticipated and that I really needed some expertise. And luckily, we have a whale bone skeleton expert in Homer, in a very close uh, community. His name is Lee Post. In order to re-articulate the whale, we uh, needed to have a large steel cart, uh, sort of a framework on which we could assemble the backbone and, and the main part of the main section of the whale. And so uh, a local welder here named Stanley Walrich was able to take Lee Post's pattern for this um, cart, which has wheels so we could wheel it around, and then um, work with us for the rest of the process on the rest of the custom work that had to be done, the custom metal work. But the first thing we had to do was drill holes in all the vertebra um, about this big. So we had to take all the vertebra over to the refuge um, maintenance shop and they had a drill press over there so we could drill these holes. And then the vertebra all had to be strung onto this uh, two inch steel pipe that formed the main structure of the whale. And it had to be bent first, so we had to have a, a pipe bender and get it into a nice S-curve. And then we threaded the vertebrae on uh, in order and spaced them apart with spacers so they wouldn't move. And then once they were locked in place, we then filled in those spaces with the clear silicone caulking that uh, replaced the cartilage that was there. During this time, we were working very carefully with Jay Shin, who is the architect of this building, um, on the size of this room, the dimensions of the room, so we'd make sure that the whale fit okay. By October 2007, we had the whale parts all together and all assembled over in the Near Island Fisheries Research Center, and we were just waiting for this building to get to the stage of completion where we could move it in. And so uh, we finally got the go-ahead to move it in uh, around the 29th of October and brought it over here and squeezed it into the building. And uh, we worked for the next three days with a big team of people to raise it up to the position that it is now. We were working right around Halloween and working at night and the building was not open to the public yet but it was all lit up inside at night and on Halloween night as we were putting the finishing touches on the whale uh, all these trick-or-treaters were coming by the building and knocking on the on the windows and looking inside at the whale and oh my gosh what kind of a monster is that going into the building. Anyway it was great fun that we completed the whale on Halloween night of 2000. Seven. Watching people come into the visitor center uh, for the first time and seeing the whale and having done that now for four years, I think the first thing they're struck by is just the beauty of it, the, the size of it, the elegance, the aesthetics of it. And then once they uh, go over to the other side of the room and go through the photo essay and they realize that this was a very uh, involved process, a seven year process from start to finish. And it's such a human story with all the community volunteers, over a hundred volunteers in the community came through to help out. Um, I think they're just struck by the human story of it as well. And I always want to know more. And